Good morning and welcome to our time of worship here this morning. We have a wonderful service for you with prayer and um, worship through scripture reading and song as well. Some of that you've already witnessed. Um, we at Heartland Crossroads Cooperative Ministries are a cooperative ministry of six town and country local rural United Methodist churches here in the most rural part of northwestern Pennsylvania. You wouldn't think so with the scenery because, you know, as you can see behind me, I'm in Mill Creek and there's cars everywhere. Arby's is very popular. Starbucks in front of me is very popular. But no, no worry about that. We'll have a great worship service together. Thank you for joining us each and every week. Or if this is your first time even, we hope that we are able to bless you. This morning we begin our time of worship through song by singing a familiar praise chorus, You're Worthy of My Praise. verses 1 through 10. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine to the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. 
Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having 10 silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We worship through song by singing an old Appalachian hymn, Come Ye Sinners, Poor and Needy. If you have the Methodist hymnals in your house, it's hymn number 340. <laughs> Even in the hustle and bustle of life, we have to take time to find quiet moments, pieces, just small moments right in between the, um, uh, the loudest parts of life to meditate, to center ourselves. So I'm going to ask you to say what I call and what has been called, it's not just called that by me, but called the Jesus prayer. It's simple. It's uh, a quick formulaic prayer. We'll say it 10 times and then go into the Lord's Prayer. The prayer is simple. Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. We'll say that 10 times together. You'll hear the traffic go by, just like the traffic goes by in your life, and you can take time to say this simple prayer and send to yourself. Won't you join me in prayer? Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. 
Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. a little bit more friendly of a gospel passage as well, seemingly at the beginning. But I always want to remind people when I speak in the pulpit, anytime that you hear um, uh, the people that are called Pharisees or religious people, think of that as yourself. Um, and I know that that's hard to do because we don't like to be the villains, but after all, most of us are the ones who come to church weekly. We uh, participate in Bible studies. We seek out opportunities to worship and opportunities to serve. Um, we are towards that religious bent. So the problem with being religious people is you can become overly religious and overly self-righteous rather than righteous um, in God's eyes and precedence. So I always want to encourage people to take on that um, um, character when they read whether it says the religious people or the 
the Pharisees. And in this case, it's the Pharisees who in uh, scribes are saying, you know, Jesus is eating with sinners. Uh, and um, it's an interesting thing to me. My biggest compliment, as well as the biggest complaint that people give me as a pastor, and it all depends on tone, is I can't believe that you're the same person outside of the pulpit as you are in the pulpit. And then the other tone, I can't believe that you're the same person outside of the pulpit that you are inside the pulpit, <laughs> you know, um, because I tend to be myself wherever I am, and that can often be somewhat ir irreverent or, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not trying to win any awards as, uh, you know, I, I'm not competing with Jesus in my righteousness. <laughs> so I've already been made one with Christ. Uh, as Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. Jesus Christ lives in me. So I don't have to run for, you know, Jesus of the year and, uh, or Methodist of the year or anything like that myself. Um, and sometimes that brings on a lot of uh, stress into parishioners' lives because we have made ourselves so uptight with our religiosity, how much we think, okay, a pastor has to look like this. Um, you know, and, and even 50 years ago, a pastor would never look like this. You know what I mean? And, 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 the, and it was 70. 70 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but it's not even cured yet, no. that, you know, religiosity in that way. Um, you know, but the, the standard uh, church list of when they're looking for pastors or leaders are often um, young, middle-aged, um, you know, on the younger side of the middle-aged with an established family, a couple kids, uh, a wife. Uh, perfect marriage kind of thing. The wife plays piano and does the nursery. And um, that's just not what happens all the time in the kingdom of God. God calls a plethora of people with myriad experiences. Um, and even the original disciples and followers of Jesus, there were some who were more traditionally righteous. Sadly, his name was Judas Iscariot. Uh, he was the one that was the most traditional in his uh, 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 religious practices. But there were some who were illiterate. There were some who were rich and smart and had the respect of the community. Um, you know, we see this with um, uh, Nicodemus um, and such. Uh, there were women. Uh, there were good women who were housewives. And I say good women in quotes, by the way, just so you know, who were housewives and kind and all that kind of stuff. But there were also women of less repute. Um, some who have been accused of perhaps being, you know, prostitutes or um, adulterers and such. And yet Jesus seemed to utilize all of their expertise, all of their gifts and talents as he traveled and ministered, healed the sick and raised the dead. Each individual part of that team was a part of Jesus's ministry. When we look at people and we separate them in categories of sin um, or even appropriate behavior or that kind of stuff, we start to limit what God can do. And the reality is when you read through the text of the Bible, and I always find this funny, like people will say, you know, we want the biblical kind of marriage. And I say, read through the Bible and show me one Bible character that had a good marriage. Abraham um, was not patient with God's promise of having a child, so he slept with another woman, his uh, slave, to uh, bear another child. Um, you know, Moses had multiple wives, David, multiple wives, Solomon, multiple, multiple, multiple wives. I mean, there's so much going on. Even blessed, beautiful Ruth slept at the bottom of Boaz's bed. And, you know, I would think most fundamentalist uh, church people would not encourage young women to sleep at the bottom of a, men's, a male's bed, because um, that gives a certain kind of image. Um, so we have all of these kind of examples in the Bible, more examples of how God uses our weaknesses as strengths and then even exalts the lowest and the weakest. Isn't that Mary's prayer after all? Strike down the powerful and the rich and raise up the poor and the needy. And that's the example of what God does. And Jesus goes so far to talk about how that is even celebrated. Um, he goes so far as to say that it's just like a woman who has lost her coin and, you know, would not be able to, to live without it, and she finds it. And all of a sudden, she invites everybody over to just say, hey, I found it. This was lost. Or how a shepherd goes after 
you know, takes the effort to go after the one sheep. He doesn't count his loss. He doesn't say, well, I guess we'll just declare that on taxes next year. No, he goes and he saves the sheep and he celebrates. So I want to encourage you throughout the course of this week to fight those urges. And I even have them uh, myself where I go, I can't believe this person's acting this way. Usually what I'm doing is I'm saying that about a religious person. I'm like, I can't believe they're so self-righteous or hypocritical or this or that. And I have to watch that too because the self-righteous uh, and the uh, hypocritical or over-religious people, they're the lost sheep too. And, you know, um, we have to be careful in our shepherding that we go after those lost sheep. Yeah, and I have similar things that some of the hardest ones for me are the ones who, to me, come across as so self-righteous and just, you know, full of themselves rather than the Holy Spirit or yeah. Jesus to me. But as you said, they are also worthy of care and understanding and listening and, you know, seeing what can be learned. And um, in terms of other one, people who are often dismissed, some of the most fascinating conversations I've had were with people who were down on their luck or just struggling and needed a listening ear. Mm -hmm. And you can gain so much from them. And often what is needed is for someone to just sit down and take the time and say, you're worthy of my attention. You're worthy of someone listening and caring. And I think if all of us could experience that and not look down on anyone and not think they're better than anyone and realize you're know, kind of that there but for the grace of God go I, um, that perhaps those who are in these situations in some ways can teach us quite a bit. Yeah. Um, and they can really, you know, to watch them flourish when they can pull, you know, come out of it and with God's help and with the help of God's disciples who are truly following the Christian ways and not looking down on people, then that's when I see miracles and the true love of God working in life. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I am thrilled when I can get to know some other people and just see the basic goodness that is present in humanity and I try to look past the other and know again you know we all have our faults we all have our foibles mm. that doesn't mean we are not worthy of the love and that we cannot be saved because you know and that God will rejoice in as Jesus said in all of the lost who make it back one of my um friends, their church has a ministry for sex workers. And some sex workers choose to be sex workers. Yes. And some uh, are forced into that mm -hmm. line of employment because of abuse, mm -hmm. uh, because of uh, just the financial situation mm -hmm. and everything. And this church ministers to those sex workers who want to transition out of that line of work. So they help find them legitimate jobs. And this is hard because when you're you know, a prostitute, sometimes you may be making you know, $25,000 a week and trying to go to McDonald's and working after that mm -hmm. is very hard. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's not an easy thing. Um, but, you know, getting out of that lifestyle can be better for these women. And that's what these, these church women help them to do. And they get them legitimate jobs, sometimes education, health care, mm -hmm. get them set up. And I've seen so much miraculous things happen to those young women and their families mm -hmm. because these ladies don't just say, well, you know, yeah. just stop. If you didn't, if you needed to, you know, you can just stop being a prostitute right now or whatever. Mm -hmm. I was like, no, it, it takes a long time. And the same thing with addicts and the same mm -hmm. thing with all kinds of sins. Um, it, repentance is not always just a quick turnaround and you're done. It takes a long time mm -hmm. and a lot of exercise to repent. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where the church can encourage people, not throw them away, yes. not yell at them, you know, yeah. not kind of bad badger them or anything like that, but just say, hey, I'm going to help you swivel <laughs> ever yeah. so slightly. Yeah. I mean, think how hard it is to give up minor bad habits. Yeah. And when I don't have any minor bad habits. They're all just like really bad. <laughs> yes, well. But yeah, Extreme bad habits. Yes. Well, you know, anything that really is, you know, probably not the wisest decision. Um, but we get so accustomed to the familiar patterns and it's what reassures us and makes us feel good because we know it, we understand it. And even body-wise, that's where your serotonin mm -hmm. and dopamine reward system are. Mm -hmm. Like it's, 
you're fighting not only your mind, but your actual mm -hmm. physical body and a soul battle. Mm -hmm. I mean, perhaps that's the brilliance of the Trinity is, you know, we're kind of a triune being ourself and, mm -hmm. and having to work all of that together is mm -hmm. pretty, pretty tough, so. Yeah, and it's not easy and more power to, you know, anyone who can pull themselves around and bless those women you were talking about who don't look down on them and don't do it condescendingly. Yep. And can just say, hey, you know, we want what is best for you because you are worth it. And that's what it is, yeah. too. It's Because they don't go in there with a van and kidnap these prostitutes right. and liberate them all. They say, if you're thinking about getting out of that kind of lifestyle, mm -hmm. we'll help. Yes. They don't, And they don't even tell the other prostitutes, you're dirty mm -hmm. pieces of trash because you don't mm -hmm. want to get out. They understand. There's reasons why mm -hmm. some people are in sex work that seem legitimate to those individuals and and make sense. I mean, like I said, even just economically, going mm -hmm. from making thousands a week to, you know, minimum wage, not not an easy thing. Mm -hmm. so. And the the great thing that, that we can do as a church is um, be that shepherd or be that woman continually looking for the lost coin. Because lost things want to be found. You know, I, if you remember when you were lost, you want to be found. So... Let's do that this week. Look for those people and individuals who are lost. And we don't say that condescendingly. We don't say that um, in, a, in a pandering way even. Just people that need found. It's a hide-and-seek game, and you are the seeker. We continue our worship by singing Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone.
Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your presence, for your guidance, for the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ, and the gift of the Holy Spirit working through us. Help us to not be lost and to look out for those who are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.